We have been discussing the background of the writing of the Mishnah. We outlined the process of oral Torah as it was given to us by Moses. And it seemed like we have a very good system, but in the second century of the Common Era, a fateful decision was made to codify the oral Torah and to write down the Mishnah. And the question that we have been talking about the last couple of weeks is, why would the Jews change such a great system? Why would they alter the system of Moshe and install a new system, the codification of the Oral Torah and the writing down of the Mishnah? So we talked about last time how the Second Temple period was difficult on many fronts. We have the rise of the Hellenists and the Sadducees, and there's all manners of internal discord. We have brutal, hostile foreign rule. We have regular assassinations of rabbis. We have the loss of prophecy as well. Things were quite tenuous, but they are about to get even more tenuous. During this era, during the era of what we call the Zugos, when the Jewish people were led by two twin titans, five of them over the course of several centuries, something happened that was unprecedented in Jewish history. Namely, there was an unresolved machlokas. There was an unresolved halachic dispute. All five of these pairs of sages wrestled and debated with the permissibility of doing smicha, placing your hands on top of a sacrifice on Yom Tov. Is that permitted to do on Yom Tov or is that considered forbidden work. This question was unresolved for hundreds of years. Now, ultimately, it was resolved that was permitted. And obviously, this is a very small component of oral law. What percentage of Torah deals with the question of, can you place your hands on top of a sacrifice on Yom Tov, on the festival? And ultimately, it was resolved. But still, we see the first cracks in this ostensibly bulletproof system. Now, by the time Hillel and Shammai arrived, Hillel and Shammai are the final ones of the Zugos, the final pair of Zugos. They themselves have not only one dispute amongst them, there are three additional disputes between Hillel and Shammai, not the Academy of Hillel, not Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, just Hillel and Shammai themselves, the final, the fifth of the Zugos. They already have Four disputes. Now, again, these disputes are very minor in the grand scheme of Torah. Very minor. How much flour is the minimum requirement to separate challah to give a portion of the dough to the coin? Is it one kav or is it two kavs of flour? Again, out of millions of laws in oral Torah, it's still pretty good to have only four disputes, but this is a harbinger of things to come. But even during Hill and Shammai's time, the nation and the sages become a little bit splintered. Now remember, this is during the times of Herod. Herod has a target on the back of the rabbis. The nation is going through very difficult times. And they want to stay low-key. They want to avoid scrutiny. And therefore... For the first and only time in history, the great sages sit in separate assemblies. You have half the sages under the academy of Shammai and half the sages under the academy of Hillel. And for the first time, the Sanhedrin, so to speak, is divided. Previously, you always had the two heads of the nation, the two Zugos, together overseeing the academy. And now, for the first time in history, you don't really have that. You have a division, and you have two concurrent schools, one of Hillel, one of Shammai, that are near each other. They're both in Israel, they're both in Jerusalem, but they're separated. In fact, if you look at the stories of Hillel and Shammai in in the Talmud, There's a bunch of stories where someone came to visit Hillel and they came to visit Shammai. They're not together. They're not united in the same academy. And consequently, 
two different schools developed and you have a major fracturing of the continuity that was always present prior. Now, after the passing of the sages, there was an effort to mend the two schools back together and to have one united academy, but the differences remained. This is going to be a major factor that's going to contribute to the ultimate writing down of the Mishnah. Moreover, the Talmud tells us there was a drop in rabbinic apprenticeship. The Talmud says that there were many students of Shammai and Hillel that didn't study under the tutelage of their masters sufficiently. They studied, but not sufficiently. Maybe they only did 10 years and not 15. And consequently, they didn't fully absorb the teachings, the traditions, the heritage of oral Torah from their teachers, and that allowed disagreements, machlokes, to fester. So if we have one dispute amongst the first four pairs of zugos, it's still manageable. It's still contained. Comes along Hill and Shammai themselves, and they have four disputes, a 400% increase. The students of Shammai and the students of Hillel, the two academies, suddenly there are hundreds of disputes. More often, base Hillel, the academy of Hillel is more lenient. The academy of Shammai is more stringent, but there are some exceptions. But this now creates, in the words of the Talmud, the one Torah became like two Torahs. This is the first time where things really get out of control. And the Talmud even tells us that this creates cultural problems. Are we one nation or are we two nations? Suppose you want to borrow a pot. You go to your neighbor, but your neighbor's from the other academy. They're from the academy of Shammai. And who knows what kind of stringencies or leniencies or differences in halacha led to what went into that pot. And maybe this pot for you, because you come from the other academy, this pot is not kosher. What do you do? Can you borrow a pot from your neighbor? Are we one religion or are we two religions? So Tama tells us that they would share pots. They would allow each other to borrow and lend pots to each other, but they would keep a set of pots, a set of cutlery that was kosher for the other side. Each one of them knew that this is the pot that I'm going to lend to my neighbor and therefore I'm going to make sure that I'm not going to play any games. I'm going to make sure this is kosher even for them. Tama goes on to tell us, that there is a dispute in a very obscure case called Tsaras Habas, which means the co-wife of the daughter. It's a very complicated case, but essentially two brothers. One of them married the other brother's daughter. So one of them married his niece and a second wife. This is again at a time where polygamy is still permitted. So brother A has two wives. One of them is his niece, which is brother B's daughter. And one of them is a random woman. And then brother A dies without any children. So of course, we know that there's the general law of a brother marrying his deceased brother's wife in the event that his brother dies without any children. But obviously, brother B can't marry his own daughter. But can brother B marry the other wife? The co-wife of his daughter. That was a dispute amongst the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel. According to the house of Shammai, the answer is yes. According to the house of Hill, the academy of Hill, the answer is no. And if you do marry that girl or that woman, your sister-in-law, then the children that you have are bastards, are mamzerim. According to Be Shammai, those kids are totally kosher. So this, the Talmud tells us, creates a major problem where half the nation is going to view certain progeny, certain children, as being illegitimate, while the other half will say they're totally fine. And now, can those children ever get married? Or will they forever have to figure out, well, did you ever come from such a lineage, from such a pedigree? So the Talmud says that even though the Academy of Shammai did their thing, the Academy of Hillel did their thing, still they would intermarry. But they would make sure that no family from the academy of Hillel would marry a child that came from questionable lineage according to the way they understand the 
Talmudic case of a Tzaras Habas, of a co-wife of a daughter. But again, we're seeing a problem develop where the Academy of and Hillel are going to create a previously non-existent problem and it's not going to be resolved for about a century. In Yavne, we'll talk about Yavne in a little bit, in Yavne, this question was resolved, but it is indicative of the changing times. Now, after Hillel and Shammai pass, no longer are we going to follow the Zugos pattern, where there's, so to speak, two co-heads of the nation and of the academy. Instead, we're going to have what's called a Nasi. A Nasi means a president. Think of it as the president of the Sanhedrin, who is a descendant of Hillel. Hillel comes from the tribe of Judah, from the family of David. And this Nasi is the equivalent of a political leader, as well as a religious leader, as well as a Torah leader. And for many centuries, the titular head of the Jewish people is going to be the Nasi, the head of the Sanhedrin, who is a direct descendant of Hillel. So after Hillel passes, his son Shimon takes over, and then his son Gamliel the Elder takes over, and then his son Shimon, and then his son Gamliel, and then his son Shimon. A little confusing. We have three Shimons and two Gamliels, and then his son, Rabbi Judah, the prince. And we have the sages once again reunited in one Sanhedrin under the Nasi, but there's still divides between the Academy of Shammai and Hillel. Those are going to persist for a little bit. Now, the first century of the Common Era was a difficult century for the Jewish people on many fronts. Of course, that is the century in which the temple was destroyed. That is the century where the Romans came down with ferocity and brutality in attacking their Jewish subjects. But there's a very interesting development that happens here in this century. The Talmud tells us that 40 years before the temple was destroyed, so think of it as either the year 28, if the temple was destroyed in the year 68, then 28, if the temple was destroyed in the year 70, then in the year 30 of the Common Era, the Sanhedrin made a dramatic decision to voluntarily weaken its power. And what they did is they left the marble chamber, they abdicated their position in the temple, temple still standing, of course, they left the temple and they moved to a different neighbor in Jerusalem. And the reason for this is because every Jewish court in the entire world, in Israel and in the diaspora, they get their mandate provided that the great Sanhedrin is in session in Jerusalem. But the Talmud tells us there was such an uptick in violent crime in the decades preceding the destruction of the temple that the Jewish courts were so busy processing capital crime cases, they said, okay, this is not the nation that we're supposed to oversee, we're supposed to adjudicate, and therefore they left the temple grounds, the great Sanhedrin left the temple grounds, and thereby they handcuffed all other Jewish courts, no longer can they adjudicate capital crime. Now they maybe outsourced it to the Romans. And this is an interesting idea. You would think that when there's a lot of violent crime, there's a lot of murder, there's a lot of capital crime, well, then the Sanhedrin should increase its power. We need them more than ever. And the answer is that the Jewish court is not there to compel observance. Rather, it's there to strengthen and to maybe buttress the nation that already is on board. The Talmud says that a Jewish court should execute someone once every seven or 70 years. It should be exceedingly rare because the nation is so righteous. Once the nation descends and the Sanhedrin is very busy and all the Jewish courts and all the lands are busy, okay, for this kind of nation, the adjudication is not supposed to be done by us. And therefore the Sanhedrin leaves Jerusalem and begins a tour of various different cities. And the Talmud tells us that over the course of its history, 
it went into exile 10 different times. They left the Marble Chamber, they went to a place called Chanut, then they went to Jerusalem, and they went to Yavne, and they went, they went to Usha, and they went back to Yavne, and they went back to Usha, Shvaram, Becharim, Tsipori, and finally, the last seat of the Sanhedrin, it was in Tiberia and Tiberias before the Sanhedrin was dissolved in the 4th century of the Common Era. So this is a very important point in history. The Sanhedrin leaves Jerusalem. They move to Yavne. And Jerusalem is, of course, where the temple is, but it is a tinderbox. There's so many different groups of Jews and everyone's vying for control. And there's such internal civil war. And then there's the revolt, the great revolt, and a four-year war culminating in the destruction of the temple begins. The rabbis, they're safely ensconced in Yavne. And the Talmud gives us a very dramatic story how Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who is the greatest sage who remains in Jerusalem, he smuggles himself out of besieged Jerusalem and he negotiates with the Roman general overseeing the siege. His name is Vespasian. And, and he's able to extract certain concessions from Vespasian. And one of them is that the city of Yavne and its great sages will be spared. He doesn't ask that the temple be spared. He asks that the city of Yavne and the great sages in the Sanhedrin will be spared. He made this calculation that Jerusalem is doomed. The temple is doomed. It's going to be destroyed. What's going to happen next? How will the nation rebuild after this traumatic destruction? Yavne is going to be the epicenter of the new, so to speak, the new nation breathed life into them by the great sages in Yavne. So this time in history, I think it's maybe one of the most critical junctures in history. Temples destroyed. The Romans are slaughtering tens of thousands indiscriminately, destroying cities. The Jewish nation has to scatter. And in fact, they again target the rabbis, the Nasi, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, the first Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, the great-grandson of Hillel, is actually executed. They chop off his head. And the last high priest, Rabbi Yishmael Koen Gadol, has his skin flayed off of him. So they're targeting the rabbis. But there is this immunity that is given to the rabbis in Yavne. And in Yavne, there's going to be a lot of very important decisions that are going to stabilize the nation and stabilize the threat to Torah. So Yavne, it has the Nasi, who is the son of the murdered Nasi, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel. His name is also Rabbi Gamliel. And the reason why it's confusing is because there's multiple Gamliels and multiple Shimons. The two Gamliels, one of them is called Rabbi Gamliel the Elder, Rabbi Gamliel Hazakein. And the current Rabbi Gamliel is Rabbi Gamliel of Yavne. And he is the Nasi. He is the president. In fact, the Romans wanted to kill him. He had to go into hiding. And he only came out. He only surfaced later once things quieted. But in Yavne, the leadership is going to be expanded. There's going to be a triumvirate lead in Yavne. Rabbi Gamliel is the Nasi. But the greatest sages are Rabbi Eliezer, known as the Chacham, the wise one. And Rabbi Yehoshua, who is the Av Beitin, the, the father of the Beitin, the father of the court, he's like the leader of the court. And there's many stories about this time period in Yavne, what these great sages, again, they're given immunity, they survive in Yavne, and now they're going to be defenders of, of their nation. So the first thing they do is they make a bunch of trips to Rome, and they petition the Romans, to alleviate the oppression of the Jewish people. They also begin to ferret out all foreign influences amongst the nation. 
So for example, there was a growing sect of the Jewish people called the Judeo-Christians. These were Jews who believed that some hero of theirs was actually the Messiah. They were regular Jews on the outside, but internally they harbored heretical beliefs. And they were amongst the Jewish people. And you didn't know if your neighbor whose son wants to marry your daughter, you wouldn't know if he's a Judeo-Christian. He wouldn't admit it. So they had a major problem. So they sat down in Yavne to solve this problem. And Shmuel HaKatan, one of the sages of Yavne, he said, I have an idea. We're going to add a new blessing to the Amidah prayer, a blessing that curses the Judeo-Christians, and then we'll force everyone who is suspected as being a Judeo-Christian, why don't you leave the services? And then they'll have to make a choice. Am I here or am I here? Which community do I want to be part of? Am I willing to go up there and curse myself and my comrades? And that decision forced these two streams, so to speak, to go in different directions. But the most important mission, the most sacred mission of the sages of Yavne was to end the descent. We've had now about a century where you have the Academy of Shammai and the Academy of Hillel, and there is a schism, so to speak. We want to have uniformity now. We're going to establish halacha, we're going to unite the nation, and we're no longer going to have these various disagreeing groups amongst our people. And the Talmud tells us that for three years, they tried to debate it out. They tried to debate, is the law like the Academy of Shammai or is the law like the Academy of Hillel? And after three years, they heard a heavenly voice that said the following. This is one of the most interesting and profound ideas in this entire subject. The heavenly voice boomed the following message. Elu va'elu divrei elokim chaim. These and these are the words of a living God. Ve'halacha and the halacha. Kibes Hillel is like the academy of Hillel. It's a very deep idea here. Both the academy of Shammai and the academy of Hillel are correct. They're both the word of a living God. They're both correct as far as God, so to speak, is concerned, in the heaven, if you were to take the Torah on its heavenly dimension, where it's in the godly infinite level, both Beishamai and Beisilo are the word of a living God. They're both correct on that level. But of course, we live here. And on this level, we have to decide either like Shammai, like the Academy of Shammai, or like the Academy of Hill. We have to decide like one, and not like the other. What this is hinting at is that the Torah is, is multidimensional. And with, and in the heavenly sphere, it's possible that two opposing positions are both true, are both Torah. But over here, vis-a-vis halacha, we have to have one and not the other. In fact, the commentaries explain that when Moses went up to heaven... Every single law, he was shown 49 angles of purity and impurity. And of course, those two are opposite. You can't be pure and impure, at least not in our world. But what Moses witnessed was purity and impurity. 49 arguments in each direction. 49 arguments for permission, for permissibility, and for prohibition. And then he asked the Almighty, Wait a minute. How do we actually behave in terra firma? And God said, that's going to be in the hands of the great sages of each generation. It's not that we're getting a monolithic Torah that we splintered. We have a godly Torah that's expansive and exhaustive and infinite, as broad as the land as deep as the sea. There are 70 facets of Torah, and all of them are called Torah. We're given a heavenly Torah, 
but we are the stewards of it. The Torah is still heavenly. Beishama, Beisel, they're both true in heaven. But here, we have to decide halacha. And in halacha, the ruling is like Beis Hillel, like the Academy of Hillel. So three years, these sages spent working on these problems. They realized how important it was at this juncture of our history to try to minimize and mitigate dispute. Our nation, because of internal discord, because of all this factionalism, we lost the temple. We lost our hegemony. We lost our security. We lost so many communities, so many of our great leaders. Now it's time to reunite. Now it's interesting. If you study this period, you'll see that there were some casualties, if you will, from this effort. You have the great sages in Yavna, and everyone's motivated. Okay, now it's time to reunite. Now it's time to unify the halacha. Now it's time to end dissent. Well, what if there is dissent? Sometimes there were even these hints of dissent that were quickly stamped out in a way that, looking back at it, seems quite tragic. There was a zero-tolerance policy that was adopted to try to stamp out any any hint, any whiff of dissent. And as a result of that, we read the story, for example, of Rabbi Eliezer and the serpentine oven. The great Rabbi Eliezer He's the Chacham. He's the greatest sage in Yavn. He's not the Nasi. He's not the official head. But he's the greatest sage. And he rules that in a very obscure case, the serpentine oven, and I know we spoke about these, these stories in the past, so we'll be brief, but it's important to hear about it in context. He rules against the rest of the sages. And he refuses to accept the ruling of the majority. Now, the reason why he refuses to accept the ruling of the majority, that's because at that particular time, there wasn't a quorum in the Sanhedrin of Yavna. And the reason for that is, even though Yavna was granted certain immunity, but at various times, things got a little hot and they split up and went in different directions. And they went underground. And then eventually they once again reunited once things quieted down. So there was a convention in Yavne, but there weren't the full quorum. And therefore, Rabbi Ezra says, even though the majority is against me, but because there isn't the quorum, I'm allowed to maintain my dissent. And Rabbi Gamliel, the head of the Sanhedrin, the Nasi, he said, no, we have partial quorum, and we have the Nasi, and that should be sufficient to follow the ruling of the majority. And Rabbi Lezer does all kinds of tricks to prove that he's right. He makes the water flow the opposite direction. He, they hear a heavenly voice. But of course, it's all rejected. And that causes the tragic aftermath of this is that Rabbi Lezer himself was excommunicated. The importance of this, we have to realize This is the greatest sage in the land. The greatest sage. The greatest sage of Yavne, we're told, okay, you're persona non grata. No one's allowed to be around you. Because you are giving off even the impression, even the hint of dissent. Now is not the time for that. The Talmud even tells that Rabbi Gamliel, right after this happened, he went on a trip, a diplomatic mission to Rome. And he's on the ship in the Mediterranean and a hurricane, a gale, attacks the ship. And he's on the ship and he knows that the reason why God is, so to speak, attacking him is because of what he did to Rebel Yezer. And he says, Master of the world, you know that I didn't do this for my own honor and not for the honor of my father's household, of the office of the Nasi. I did it for your honor. 
so that there will not be a lot of machlokas, there will not be a lot of disputes amongst the people. He makes a declaration, and right away the waters calm. That to make things even more complicated, Rebbe Liezer and Rebbe Gamliel were brothers-in-law. So this had a, a, a familial component to it as well. Now, people are actually bothered by this story a lot. Because you read the story, it seems pretty clear that Rabbi Eliezer was correct. His ruling was correct. Yet, because the majority went against him, his ruling is rendered incorrect. And we say Torah is not in the heavens. Whatever the ruling of the Sanhedrin here is, that's the law. But if he's right, that means the Sanhedrin got it wrong. So how do we square with the fact that maybe we have halacha that's wrong? The Talmud even goes on to say how one of the sages went and met Elijah the prophet. And they asked Elijah the prophet, what does God think about our dispute? So Elijah said that God is saying, banai, my sons have triumphed over me. It seems like Rebbe is with God. And the Sanhedrin is triumphing over God? Is that what we want to do with Torah? This is an interesting question. Some want to speculate that no, Rebbe Lezer was wrong. In the heavens he was right, but here he was wrong. What that means is a very subtle question. But the Sefer HaChinuch, he says a very powerful idea. Let's assume, for argument's sake, that Rebbe Lezer was correct. And the Sanhedrin got it wrong. Yet we're told in the Torah to follow the word of the Sanhedrin and to not deviate from it, not right and not left. What that means is that even if they're wrong, we should follow them. Because you know what? We still have a nation. And the second we abandon the Sanhedrin, we lose the nation. And it's better for us to have one law, the serpentine oven law. Let's be wrong with that. Let's be wrong. But we're wrong in one thing. The second we lose Sanhedrin, we're wrong in everything. And our nation dissolves. But this shows us again, what was the focus of the sages of Yavna? The focus was, okay, we've spent a hundred years arguing. Now let's resolve our differences. And they rule indeed that the law follows the Academy of Hillel. But Rebel Yezra is a casualty. And Rabbi Yeshua, who was the Av and was the head of the court, he too had his run-ins with Rabban Gamliel. And there was one story where they had a disagreement as to whether or not witnesses were good witnesses, were reliable witnesses for the purposes of making a new moon, and consequently, there would have a different calendar. And that was the month of Tishrei. So there was a dispute as to what day was Yom Kippur. And the Sanhedrin ruled that Yom Kippur is on day 10. And according to Rabbi Yoshua's calculation, it will be on day 11. So Gamaliel tells Rabbi Yoshua, I want you to come to me on day 11, the day you think is Yom Kippur. According to us, is the day after Yom Kippur. But the day that you think it's Yom Kippur, you must come to me. I declare upon you. I decree upon you. You must come to me holding your staff, holding your money pouch, violating, so to speak, Yom Kippur to show that you accept the ruling of Sanhedrin. And there was another story between Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Gamliel that actually got Rabbi Gamliel deposed. They fired him. And that was the question of whether or not the evening prayer is obligatory or not. Is it optional? A student went to Rabbi Yeshua and says to him, is the evening prayer obligatory or optional? And he says it's optional. And this same student goes to Rabbi Gamliel and says to him, same question, is the evening prayer obligatory or optional? He says it's obligatory. So the student tells Rabbi Gamliel, wait a minute. I just spoke to Rabbi Yoshua, and he told me that it was optional. And now you're telling me that it's obligatory. How do we square that? So Rabbi Gamliel says, okay, wait. Wait till 
everyone gathers together and we'll figure out what happened here. So the entire academy assembles together and they're going to hear a lecture from the Nasi and they're going to st- discuss matters of Torah. And Rehobila opposes the question, is the evening prayer optional or is it obligatory? And Rehobila says it is indeed obligatory. And then he makes the announcement, is there anyone in the room who disagrees with this? No one says anything. Everyone seems apparently to acquiesce. So then he turns to Rabbi Yahushua and says to him, I heard in your name that you said that it was optional. Stand up on your feet and let's testify what your opinion really is. So Rabbi Yahushua stands up on his feet and he says, listen, you got me. If this other student wasn't around, I could maybe lie my way out of this. But now that he's around, there's no way I could lie my way out of this. Indeed, you are correct. I believe that it is optional. Now, Rabbi Gamliel made a decision here for which he was fired. He said, I want to teach Rabbi Yoshua a lesson. I want to teach everyone a lesson. I want to teach everyone that now was the time to end dissent. So the rest of the lecture, he did not tell Rabbi Yoshua, okay, you could sit down. He made him stand up, and then he never allowed him to sit down. So for the rest of the lecture, you have this great sage, one of the heads of, of Yavna, the head of the Basin, arguably a greater sage than Rabbi Gamliel himself, is being forced to stand in a humiliating fashion. So in the middle of the speech, a group of students torpedo the lecture and they tell the maturgamon the maturgamon is like the um, amplifier that's the you know the great sage if there's thousands of people without microphones he, he would whisper the message the lessons to someone who had a very strong booming voice and that person would announce it to everyone so they tell him no more talking from you and they torpedo the, the, the lecture and they say to Rabbi Gamil, I'm sorry, you are no longer the head of Sanhedrin. We're going to find a replacement. And they fire him. And they find a replacement, whose name is Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, who happens to be only 18 years old at the time. And it's a long story, but eventually Rabbi Gamil is restored and there's like an a system where he alternates. Three weeks out of four, Rabbi Gamliel gives the lecture, and the fourth week, Rabbi Elizabeth Azaria, he is the, so to speak, the assistant Nasi, and he gives a lecture every fourth week. But this again shows us what is happening in Yavna. We're trying to weed out any disputes, we're trying to end, to stamp out any dissent, and we're trying to unite and unify the nation once again. Now there's an interesting personality in this story it's one of the secret heroes and that is Rabbi Yochanan Metzakai he was in Jerusalem and he was one who negotiated Yavna to be spared and he comes to Yavna but he's so revered as a sage he realizes that if I stay here I'm going to overshadow the young Nasi Rabbi Gamliel so he voluntarily picks up, goes home, leaves Yavne to make sure that the power and the influence of the young Nasi is not going to be curtailed. Now, as we've spoken about in the past, all along this time in history, the Sanhedrin is making all kinds of new decrees and ordinances to keep the nation on top of their game, so to speak. And there's actually nine different decrees that we have from Rabbi Yochum Zakai when he was still in Yavne for that short period before he left. And a lot of these decrees actually play a part in our religion today. So for example, we shake the lula of the entire Sukkot. Before the temple was destroyed, we only did it for one day. And only in the temple they did it for seven days. With the destruction of the temple... 
Rabbi Yonah Mazaka made a decree that even outside the temple, we shake the lulav for all seven days of Sukkot. Blowing the shofar on Shabbat. Can we do that? In Yavne, decrees Rabbi Yonah Mazaka that we can. All kinds of interesting decrees that he makes vis-a-vis making a new moon, making a new Rosh Chodesh. But again, this process continues. There's other decrees that are done here. There was a group called the Kuthians, another splinter set of the Jewish people. Any meat that is slaughtered by the Kuthians is forbidden as a decree. In Usha, remember we talked about the various places where the Sanhedrin went in exile. One of the places was Usha. The Talmud gives a list of decrees and ordinances that were made there. Now, even though the Sanhedrin is granted immunity, at various times, like we mentioned, they had to disperse and go underground. And that is actually the background for Rabbi Eliezer's descent because he made his argument at a time where the Sanhedrin was not in full session, he thought that the rules governing the majority wins in a Sanhedrin debate, he thought it wouldn't apply when there's not a sufficient quorum. But it's interesting, the Talmud tells us some stories that happened when the great sages were hiding. Even though the Romans are allowing Yavne to exist, at various times, things get difficult. The rabbis have to run. So the Talmud gives us two interesting stories about what happened when the sages were hiding in an attic in the city of Lud, which is nearby to Yavne. Who were they hiding from? They're hiding from the Romans. And the Talmud says that they would have halachic disputes in the attic. So one of them, for example, is the question of Under what circumstances must you give up your life, forfeit your life, and not violate a Torah commandment? We know there's the three cardinal sins. You have to give up your life and not transgress. That was finalized by a small group of the Sanhedrin in an attic in Lud, hiding from the Romans. Talmud gives us another interesting story, an interesting debate. What is greater, to study Torah or to do mitzvos, Which one of those are greater? That was a discussion that happened, again, in an attic in Lud. And ultimately, the Talmud agrees, or the, the sages agreed, that Torah study is greater because it indeed brings to acts of mitzvos. But throughout this period, in this final stretch run, before the mission is being written down, things are difficult and things stay difficult and the Jewish people are always on the brink. You have the emperor Trajan who had a horrific hostility towards the Jews, but none of them, of course, equaled the persecutions of the emperor Hadrian. Hadrian was almost like a reincarnation of Antiochus. He makes all kinds of crippling decrees against Jewish practice that are almost word for word out of the playbook of Antiochus. The laws of Nida, laws of family purity, public teaching of Torah, laws of Shabbos, bris milah, circumcision. All those are banned. And this, of course, precipitates the most successful of all revolts, the Bar Kokhba revolt. It's a long war. It's bloody on both sides. But again, the Romans eventually crush the rebellion. And when they crush it, they perpetrate one of the greatest massacres in Jewish history. And this, by the way, happened, the the, the fall of Betar, which was the last stronghold of Bar Kokhba's rule, of Bar Kokhba's army, that actually fell on Tishabov the same day that the temple was destroyed about 60 years earlier. And that's considered like the final reverberation of the temple being destroyed. According to both Jewish and Roman sources, we're dealing with a million dead. Now, the Talmud gives us a silver lining that the Romans did not allow the Jews to bury their dead. But miraculously, 
the dead did not decompose. And therefore, the sages, after this horrific event happened, they instituted the fourth blessing of the Berkat Amazon, Hatov Vahametiv, God is good and does good to us, even though this is very difficult times, he still did this great miracle for us to allow the bodies to not decompose so we could bury them with dignity. Now, Jewish sources talk about 10 martyrs, 10 great sages that were killed in this 60 to 70 year period from the destruction of the temple to the fall of Betar. So, of course, we talked about the last high priest, Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Gadol, Rabbi Shmuel the, the high priest. His skin was flayed, and they would parade his skin throughout Rome. And we talked about the last Nasi, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, Rabbi Hanina ben Shiradion, he was burned to death. Rabbi Tiva, he was imprisoned, and he was subsequently flayed. This is at the time of the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Hadrian forbids the conferring of smicha, of rabbinic ordinance. He said, if you give smicha, I'm going to kill you. If you receive smicha, I'm going to kill you too. Moreover, a city in which smicha is conferred, the entire city is going to be slaughtered. Smicha is the way where we confer rabbinic stature to the next members of the Sanhedrin. It's this continuity that we have since Moshe. The Talmud gives a story of Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava, a very old sage, who gathers a bunch of students and goes between two cities and gives them smicha. But the Romans get wind of it, and they come and they pepper him with spears and they kill him in a horrific way. Again, we're seeing the continuing pattern. Torah is being threatened. Jewish continuity is on the rocks. How are we going to perpetuate Torah when the great sages are being targeted, when millions are being killed, when the Sanhedrin can't even unite and discuss questions of Torah in the academy? Talmud gives us an interesting story how when Rabbi Akiva was in prison, and he was the greatest sage at that time, his students would still come to the prison and would try to ask questions to him through the window, so to speak, of the prison. And Talmud gives a great story about one of the students of Rabbi Akiva, whose name was Rabbi Yochanan Hassanler, and he disguised himself as a peddler, and he asks questions, but he presents himself as if he's selling needles. Who wants to buy needles? Who wants to buy needles? But that's a code that's conveyed to Rabbi Akiva in the prison. He's able to understand what the question is and is able to give him an encrypted answer. The Talmud also tells how Rabbi Shimon came to visit him in prison. But again, this is indicative of the time. The Talmud tells us how Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 students. Torah was burgeoning. But they all died. There are some that speculate that they died in this Bar Kokhba revolt and its aftermath. The Talmud said that the world was empty of Torah. It was bereft of Torah. All of the sages were dead. And Rabbi Kiva goes to the south and finds five promising students and through them, Torah is repopulated. But even those students are attacked or targeted. Rabbi Shimon, one of the students of Rabbi Kiva, one of those five students, the Romans decreed that he is going to be executed and he has to hide in a cave for 13 years. So again, we see how it's a very, very difficult time to perpetuate Torah. The era of the Second Temple and the century that followed it of course, it's an era that is replete with absolute giants, some of the great heroes of our history. Hillel, Rabbi Yochanan Metzakai, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Shua, the triumvirate of Yavne, Rabbi Akiva, and of course, there's many more that we haven't even mentioned. But several times over this period, 
we see how the nation is, is hanging on a thread. And it's, of course, miraculous that Torah did endure that long. We talk about divine intervention. We have these legends arriving at just the nick of time. Ezra coming, Hillel coming, Rabbi Akiva coming, Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai with the foresight to ask for Yavna to be spared. It's an era of unprecedented challenges to the continuity of Torah. And at this time, there's going to begin a mass migration of Jews back to Babylon. And the Sanhedrin is going to remain in in Jerusalem or in Israel, but things are not going to get easier once we have the nexus of, of the people, the, the epicenter of the nation, traveling east. So at this time, there was a little bit of a window, a brief window, a brief respite of Roman hostilities, and arguably the most consequential decision in Jewish history was made, and that is to write down, to codify the Oral Torah. Talmud tells us that on the day that Rabbi Akiva died, was killed, a young boy was born. His name was Yehuda. And he's going to be known to us, of course, as Rabbi Judah the Prince. This was at a time where circumcision was still prohibited. And if someone would be circumcised, they would kill the baby and kill the mother for good measure. And we're told in the Midrash how the Romans invited young Judah and his mother as small suckling infants to Rome to inspect him to find out if he's circumcised. And the Talmud gives us a very dramatic story how along the way they stop at a hotel and Rabbi Judah the prince's mother befriends a Roman mother of a young child. And eventually they figure out why she's going to Rome and they make a switcheroo. Rabbi Judah the prince's mom takes the Roman baby and the Roman mom takes Rabbi Judah the prince. So when she arrives in Rome, she presents an uncircumcised boy. And eventually they swap the babies back. And according to the Midrash, that young Roman baby grows up to become the emperor of Rome. Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. And he becomes best buddies with Rabbi Judah the Prince. And he provides the political cover to facilitate this last final union of the academy in Israel. And then write down the Mishnah. And we have this pivotal character in Jewish history. He is a student of all the students of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir, one of the five students, Rabbi Shimon, one of the five students, Rabbi Judah the Prince is a student of them. And this is this uninterrupted line, back to Hillel, back to Moses, and they're going to, him, together with his academy, are going to undertake the most monumental project in Jewish history, the writing down of the Mishnah, and the codification of oral Torah. How they did that, how they pieced together this monumental project, how they divided up Oral Torah into 63 different books spread out over six orders, six general subject matter categories? What were the decisions that were made to enable this? That's the subject that we will talk, please God, about next time. As always, my email address is rabbiwolbergmail.com. I want to make everyone aware, if you don't know this yet, I actually have six podcasts that you can listen to on your phone, the Jewish History Podcast, Parsha Podcast, Torah 101, the Mitzvah Podcast, the Ethics Podcast, and This Jewish Life. Take a listen, five-star reviews, and always my email address is rabbiwobajima.com. It was an absolute joy and pleasure talking to y'all today.